Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sovereign Spirits, where we explore methods on how to escape the reincarnation cycle, transcend the white light, and use our intention in a willful and powerful way to manifest an afterlife as sovereign spirits. I am here with co-creator and co-host of the show, Wayne Bush. Hi, Julie. It's nice to be with you again. Hope you're doing good. Yes, I am. Thank you. I'm excited to continue with our episodes. As am I. So in the last episode, we started the, the episodes on pre-birth memories. And I touched on some emails that I had received for some people who remember before they were born, where they were at and what happened. And I went over a few online accounts that I've seen. There's a website in particular, I think I said it was prebirthmemories.com, I, I think, or it was prebirthexperiences.com. Anyway, okay. um, so I went, went over those and I read some from Helen Wambach's 1979 book, Life Before Life. And then in this episode, we're going to get into this fantastic book called Cosmic Cradle, Spiritual Dimensions of Life Before Birth by Elizabeth, Elizabeth M. Carmen, Neil J. Carmen, and Bernie S. Siegel. And, and then at the end, I'm going to go over an experience that I found online from a podcast that someone had shared. So it's going to be quite interesting, I, th I think, and I yes. can't wait to get into it. It's pretty That's cool. We want to uh, make sure and cover everything and try to do it under an hour if possible. Yes, I think, I think we'll be able to do that this time. So, um, so that in this book, um, Cosmic Cradle, they first talk about these different types of pre-birth experiences, they call them, and they say the ultimate inspiration came from the adults and children who shared two types of pre-birth experiences, pre-birth memory and pre-birth communications. Pre-birth memories are defined as natural, spontaneous memories of life before birth, choosing parents and life circumstances and the journey from the heavenly world to conception, life in the womb, and birth itself. We excluded reports based upon methods like hypnosis, drugs, regression, and psychic readings. The second set of pre-birth reports involve spontaneous announcing signs or pre-birth communications between a child waiting to be born and parents or relatives. Pre-birth communications are defined as subtle contacts with the unborn via dreams, visions, and inner voice, feeling the unborn child's presence, telepathy, and a host of other announcing signs. These mysterious communications occur before or after conception and establish a new parent-child relationship. Love for a child begins long before birth. So this is a little confusing to me. Like, I mean, I think the ones that are just spontaneous memories are by far the better ones than the, just the communications right. personally. But and maybe I'm right. not sure which ones are which, which kind of confuses a little bit. But they say there's four different principles of the pre-birth uh, paradigm. And they say it's an inspirational, optimistic message worthy of review. And one, individuals with expanded awareness recall life before birth. Two, consciousness and memory go beyond the brain. Three, sensitive parents are aware of souls seeking birth. And four, our life plan is designed prior to birth. And then they outline these common elements. And the first one is self-aware of their true blissful nature. The physical body is a garment, a cage, shell a temporary housing for the soul and two that they're eternal three is the feeling at home like the heavenly world is their true home their sense of belonging four is limitless love which we've heard about like a near-death experience and it's many expanded states of awareness five that there's soul families like this heaven's this place teeming with souls and you exist with loved ones and groups and six is telepathy they report telepathy and instantly manifesting whatever they think or of travel via mere intention. And this is something we really think is key on the other side is this manifestation through intention. So that's a very important one. Seven, spirit guides, angels, divine planners, great being, creator, a higher being tells them they are going on a journey and will return home one day. Guides assist in pre-birth planning and escort them to their mother's womb. The big one. <laughs> Eight, pre preview and life plan. Their upcoming life appears like a Hollywood movie or images on a computer screen. They are given options for parents and lessons to learn. Nine is pre-birth amnesia. 
They may feel parts of their pre-birth memory being erased as they descend on the way to Earth. Some are also aware of amnesia gradually taking place in childhood. And then the last few are just like interest in this human experience that some are reluctant to be born, whereas others have a strong desire. 11 is this awareness in the fetus, like most souls feel a loss of freedom, constricted awareness, and a feeling of being in a cage. And then the last ones, there's no fear of death, and some even look forward to returning home. So those are the commonalities that they go through, and quite a few of those are pretty interesting, especially the ones with the amnesia and the guides planning the life, and that they have the ability to manifest with using their intention immediately. Yeah very important yeah so then they get into the actual memories themselves so the one of the ones is uh where they're falling to earth from the pure light and they say um pre-birth memories fade just as a muscle atrophies from lack of exercise summer a 35 year old midwestern mother of six children recalls at the age of four i experienced several incidents of lying in bed and telling myself i must remember my birth Forever after, I mentally reviewed the memory so I would not forget, somehow recognizing its importance. Despite that, my memories did end up becoming secondhand or dormant for a while. I did not deliberately seek to remember them, but they just popped back up and were refreshed after I did a six-month meditation retreat. Remember I mentioned that. This is the one. They have been remarkably clear ever since. Summer remembers the inner world of light, the cosmic cradle. Must be where they got the idea from the name of the book. She says, my memory goes back to a place of pure light intermittently between lives. My individuality was barely audible. That is the best way I can describe it. All my senses became unified. Everything was one. Still, I had a subtle feeling of minus identity, ego, or individuality. I felt the presence of God, of not being totally one with God, but being in God's wombs, wombs, so to speak. I was aware of other souls close by. It is hard to explain because there's no space and time, only the present moment and other souls coming toward and going away from me. When the time came to establish my next life, I traveled through a tunnel filled with lights representing the laws of nature and different people. I had an ongoing dialogue with an angel, God, an aspect of God or St. Peter. It is hard to say exactly who he was. I desired to achieve the maximum in terms of clearing up karma and reaching enlightenment. We discussed what I needed and how to achieve my purpose with certain people. I saw my goals as well as all the choices that I could make as if I were looking at a computer board, only the computers seemed like stars. It's quite interesting. When I saw a quality I needed to develop like kindness or compassion, I pressed the corresponding light. Then in a millisecond, I witnessed a panoramic view of roads I could take with different people in order to fulfill those objectives. It is not as if my consciousness said, give me a good life. I want to be rich or I want to be pretty. Rather, it was simply I needed to establish the quality of kindness and compassion first, then the wealth would come. I'd emphasize certain choices more than others. Since enlightenment was a major goal, I made a special effort toward having my meditation mastered. There was no other path before me. I did not allow any leeway, and nothing in this life has ever interrupted this relationship with my teacher. As part of her life agreement, Summer planned to be born into a family with Susan as an older sister. The sisters had evolved through many lifetimes together. So that was pretty interesting. Then she like was able to, after six months of meditative retreat, she was able to bring back quite a few memories. <laughs> well, um, Go on a meditation retreat. <laughs> I'm ready. I want to know. I'm ready. Yeah. Six months. It's a vacation. Let's book it. Um, the next one's Divine Planner. The Divine Planner added more details. This man has a choice, yet most likely he will choose the path of drug abuse. I saw a vision of a man sitting on the ground with folded knees, his head resting on his knees and his arms wrapped around his legs. Next, the divine planner asked, do you want this man to physically harm you? I said, no way. He explained, you learn the divine lessons quicker when these things occur. I said, I don't want the guy to hit me. My husband's never physically abused me for the personality he has played, a drug act, that is amazing. I've pushed his buttons. Fortunately, it is not in the divine plan for him to hit me. I resisted the next choice, choose an injury. I replied, I don't want to get hurt. Forget it. I'm not choosing an injury. The divine planner told me, you will learn from these things. I finally agreed. Okay, my hand. 
He was disappointed that I picked something minor, but made the entry into his computer. He's got a computer. Okay, <laughs> that's my interjection there. Mm. She said, I broke my hand five years ago. The injury was part of the divine plan. So it's interesting that he has actually had a computer over there, is it not? Um, why is a computer needed? I mean, maybe his memory's not so good. I mean, I, I don't know. It's just interesting that he has a computer. It's so suspicious. <laughs> yeah, it's a little curious. Okay, and the fact that he was disappointed that she only wanted a minor injury. Yeah, what's what's the? I don't know. What's his concern? If she, let's just say this is all growth process, and we want. Well, she's to not going to learn as fast, apparently, with a minor that, injury. Why? Why is that? That should be up to her, right? Yeah. <laughs> What's his interest in it? <laughs> yeah. Why does he want her to grow so fast when we've got all of time, right? We got forever. What's the big hurry, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't understand why they would pressure us in that way. Like in other words, well, I don't know. He did say that it's going to take longer or whatever. <clears throat> the next one is formless form spirit guide. If Elizabeth stayed to be born as a boy, she risked a divorce and losing the set of parents that she needed. A divine planner helped Elizabeth decide the next course of action. A formless form counseled me about my options. When I say I counseled with a formless form, that divine energy did not have boundaries. The divine energy did not need a physical form to have an identity, a uniqueness, or a self. This energy was in front of me, inside of me. Even so, it was not me. I perceived it as distinct and personal, a direct communication without words, telepathy. Counseling with the formless form was a formality. A time limit existed for choosing what I wanted to do. I was presented options to be born to the same parents or to opt out. The formless form showed me five choices in grading orders such as A, B, C, D. My choices were A++, B, 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 and C. In my case, whom I chose as my parents was a no-brainer. Mom and dad were my A++, my absolute first choice, because only this particular couple could provide what I needed, not what I wanted. I had other choices, but I never gave them any consideration. My choice was not based on material satisfaction. Where am I going to have the happiest home? Where will I have all my needs taken care of? My decision was based on the spiritual growth and fulfillment I needed and for the setting the foundation to become whatever I will become in this world or something spiritual later on. The decision was 100% mine. I had my own idea of what I wanted to become and it was crucial that this set of parents raise me. Mm. This next one is called The Void but I don't think it's the void like we were talking about in near-death experiences. It's just sort of a void-like experience. So I don't know, make up it what you will. It says, he recalls that his spirit floated in an empty universe with no stars or planets, the void. From a distance, Vincent could see his fetal body surrounded by a light pinkish red energy inside his mother's womb. I saw my body that was growing for my soul. Prior to birth, a guided tour of images of his parents announced what to expect. This is what you get for your money. You've made a choice and there is no way back now. These are your parents. This is what they will look like. Good luck. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good this luck is what you'll get it. for your money. Huh? Yeah, I know. Isn't that really weird? Almost like we've got credit over there to allocate because he was saying, oh, you got to like, this is my A++. I'm going to spend my money this way or my credits or my first choices. I don't know. It's strange why it should be uh, any restrictions like that at all. But <clears throat> next one is chose to be a boy. I choose to be a boy. Matt, an electrician in his mid-20s, has preserved deep memories of his pre-life. I remember before I came into the womb, everything was dark. I felt empty. I was waiting for something to direct me. Then my consciousness suddenly clicked on. I became aware that I existed. A thought from seemingly nowhere asked, what do you want to be? Those exact words entered my mind. I knew the answer, I want to be a boy. I instantly left that dark space and came into light. My pre-birth memory has stuck with me. I can differentiate it from memories of everything I've gone through in my body. This happened before I came me. I find it kind of interesting that this thought came out of nowhere. So it's like, we, I think we need to be careful. Of, and he was also waiting for something to direct him. It's like, you're, that's a yeah. passive mode and you're not taking your sovereignty at that point. You're waiting for something else to direct mm -hmm. you. And this that'll maybe perhaps allow that thought to come out of nowhere. So I think we need to be careful about thoughts and how we react to them 
and uh, very much yeah very much so was it there yeah somebody else's thought put there how do we know that um yeah I'm but that that's passiveness, i wonder about that passiveness too with being like drawn or attracted to the white light some some have said well i didn't Design, I didn't choose to go to the white light, but maybe they didn't not choose it. Maybe that it was a mm -hmm. path mode that allowed them to be attracted. Just a thought. Yeah, it's very possible. So um, next, a cosmic contract with strings attached. <laughs> Rob, an art professor and meditation teacher, conversed with a guide before birth. He was given two options. I remember being in the space between life and death and on the other side and being given a choice whether to incarnate in 1948 or to wait 20 years. If I incarnated in 1948, I would be a spiritual pioneer, paving the way for others on the path to enlightenment. I would incur good karma by taking this difficult path and removing roadblocks for others. If I waited 20 years, my life would be easier. I chose 1948 and also picked to come in with my father. I remember being almost impulsive about my decision. My guide explained that choice involved a packaged deal. It included my mother and brother and karma to be worked out with these people. Part of me looked with chagrin at being with my mother and brother. Still, I thought I will be strong enough to handle anything. The positive factors of being with my father outweighed the negative. So here they're, one, they're mentioning karma, which is another factor that keeps being brought up as if we have to pay off bad deeds somehow, or that we um, need to balance that for some reason, you know? I just don't know how you would not, you could, anyone could go through this life and be perfectly balanced and have no karma and cross over and, oh, I am figured right. it out. I well, mean, maybe, according I to him, maybe you get some good something. karma. Like if you open doors for people and you say beautiful things about them, maybe you incur some oh, good it, ones. It, Ballot. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah, you can't, it's impossible not to go through an 80 year life or more without having said an unkind word to somebody or done something that hurt somebody else's feelings. And then they're going to say, well, you have to, you know, do make, make retribution for that. It's, and then it just keeps, you know, an eye for an eye and it just keeps growing and growing. And, and unless, and not everyone's going to forgive you for your actions either. You know, it's just, I don't know. Karma, and I always I just, wonder about the temptation of wanting to come here and be a savior or help the progression mm -hmm. of humanity help that would play upon our desire to be, you know, useful to this place. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It seems maybe there's a little manipulation there. It's something to think about. Okay. The next one chose his parents. Rennie believes we choose our parents because he recalls making that choice. I remember this as a young kid. It kept coming back to me through the years. I spoke to my mother about it when I was seven. I said something about where I came from and those other people I was with. That was a short and sweet one. This one is looking glass portal and tested like Job. Rennie, oh, it's still, still Rennie. Rennie's yeah. memories stretch back to being in an assembly of souls and observing earth through a bird's eye portal. I was up in this high place and I could look down. It was like looking down from an airplane or a dirigible. It was like standing on a long ledge and you look down at the earth. There were souls to my right and souls to my left. They looked like human beings. The only difference was they were not dressed like people on earth. Everyone wore full length white kimonos. They were making the same decision that I was making. Conversations were going on all around me. Souls were pointing down to earth and selecting parents. I knew who the directors were by their attitude and actions. My guide stood on my right and held me by the arm. He had superiority over me. I felt like a student and he was a full-fledged teacher. What is so amazing is that I visualized that I would return to this place in the hereafter. We go to earth as children. Before that, we are mature spiritual beings up there. When I looked down, I was given a choice of three couples having intercourse. I asked, if I take this couple, my reward will be equally as great, right? He said, yes, except you will have a hard time and it will be frustrating to pass God's test. Part of your trial will be to fall short of achieving what you are really capable of. But the other two couples you would just about have it made, decide on the couple you want. I answered the couple with the greatest trials. He asked, are you sure? I said, yes. I had no special feelings towards the wealth of each of the couple. We are born on earth for soul growth. It is a matter of choosing what degree of salvation we want. I desired to shoot for the top maximum salvation. I wanted to prove myself. 
As soon as I chose my parents, I entered a huge round tunnel. I flew down that tube at a terrific speed. Lights coming from a narrow band flashed by. The lights wrapped all through that tube like a red stripe on a peppermint candy cane. The light circle never broke. It was dark except for the band of light. 30 years later, in the 1990s, Rini underwent nine surgical procedures over a two-year battle with cancer. During the first cancer surgery, he had an NDE. My heart stopped for four minutes. I floated out of my body. I looked down and saw the body that was me. I saw huge carpenter's clamps holding me open so the doctor could operate on my intestines. I chose a life with the greatest spiritual reward and not a cushy life of material success. Even though I chose the tough road, I wanted to know why I had so much trauma. One night I prayed for an answer. An angel appeared and said, God needs good Jobs, the biblical Job, in this world, and you are one of them. God needed to test my character to see if my commitment to him would bear up under adversity. I trust he saw what lessons I needed to learn. There's so. a direct comparison to Job of the Bible, which was quite an interesting story. This, so first of all, that kind of reminded me of the movie Soul, some of his uh, mm -hmm. description. But um, yeah, so there's a director, he says, that's how he calls the, mm -hmm. gu the guides, the, the director. <laughs> but he, I thought he had said um, that his soul was perf perfected or perfect in that realm. And then he, yeah, and then, he did allude to something like that. So if that you're movie. perfected in that realm, then why, why does the soul <laughs> need to learn? And yeah, he said, realm? I knew who the directors were by their attitude and actions. So yeah, there's definitely directors like Jerry's, like in the movie Soul or something like that. And um, it says we're born on earth for soul growth um, and for maximum salvation. It's like, why do we need to be saved? What are we being saved from if everything is so wonderful over there to begin with? Yeah, yeah I could have sworn you read something like, yeah, we're, we're, our souls are perfect or complete or something on that realm. And then it's, and then we come here to learn. He says, before that, we are mature spiritual beings up there. We're mature spiritual beings. Why do we need to come down here? Because God needs us. To test you. He needs, <laughs> God needs, what does God need anything for? <laughs> anyway. Right. I don't know. We need to become more mature. Like, there's always this, how big do we need to be? Like, yeah. when is enough enough? Like, we just need more, 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 more. I don't know. I just no, oh, just I don't know. I don't understand it. So the next one is um, Supreme Watcher or Witness in the Womb. Lorenzo refers to his broad womb time awareness as being a supreme watcher or witness, being aware of the higher self while simultaneously witnessing his thoughts and actions. Due to this heightened awareness, Lorenzo recalls coming into the fetus, witness, witnessing the dramas in his parents' lives, and exiting to other planets. Earth would be blessed if people located that beautiful place inside themselves where the Supreme Witness takes over, where people become aware of who they really are. I cannot pinpoint when my soul entered my mother's womb. However, I recall that special, the special process or divine infusion that took place as my soul infused with the matter body or matter being, the fetus in the womb. The connection was made in the initial spark of self-love. We cannot be born without self-love, without self-acceptance. The soul has a contract with the matter being, i.e. the union of egg and sperm, so that it can fulfill its life's lessons in that particular body. The soul brings parallel life memory and karma on the soul level with it. The matter being, physical body, brings genetic memory and karma on the physical level with it. I was drawn into the drama and heavy lessons began. On the other hand, it was the grounding point, part of my cosmic contract. We need to pay attention to discomfort. The valleys can be as accelerating as anything else. Both negativity and positivity are exhilarating when we have no attachment. A car moves forward due to its batteries, negative and positive poles. So too, our peaks and valleys give us permission to evolve fully. As Nietzsche said, be careful about casting out your demon. You might be casting out the best part of you. We tend to deny our negative side. This is a mistake. Both sides are important. If we release ourselves from attachment to good and bad, we expand our being. All lessons are born through the coexistence of opposites. So that 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 one is like praising duality, like we need the good and the bad and both polarities, right? It's um, hmm. like you can't yeah. have the good without the bad or 
you know, you, there's an opposite and equal reaction or something. I mean, I just don't see why we need such extreme negatives. Why can't there just be like a, a positive and just a kind of a lack of positive? So that's kind of an emptiness kind of thing. Like, why does it have to be such pain and extreme suffering on the other end? It seems so. Uh, yeah, and on plenty of these experiences, NDE years pre-birth, they say that there are other planets and places where it is more like that. Mm -hmm. we, we can choose to go to these other there's places. There's no war, so, there's no jobs that you loathe, there's no disease and suffering, so, aging. So, I, they, yeah, that, why, then why the need for this particular yeah, it just seems like some people really get off on the extreme challenge or the extreme um, excitement or something of it. I don't know. Um, they just like a challenge, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe they're masochistic and they, they've gotten addicted to this, the, 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 the suffering, the game, the, you know, like people that are addicted to even abuse or drugs or alcohol. I mean, they're, they're, they know their life is being destroyed, but they can't break free from the cycle for some reason. It's just um, too, maybe the, ex, the allure of excitement of when they're under the drug. I mean, maybe life for some people is sort of like a drug. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, but, I, but some of these um, that you've shared when they're kicking and screaming and they're like pleading and they don't want to, they, they apparently aren't addicted they they want out but no True. god needs them to be the job of the, on the planet and then <laughs> yeah um next one's a family needs that's us to suffer. God yeah. needs us to suffer. i was just thinking well god needs us to suffer anyway but apparently yeah um god, yeah, it reminds that. me of the roger water song what god wants anyway <laughs> God, God, God wants famine, God wants war, God wants all this stuff. Anyway, a family that does not want me. I peered down and said, look, I can come into a family that does not want me. Oh, how wonderful that would be. Maybe I could even turn that around. How exciting. There is a whole different perception when we are choosing. On this side, I would never have chosen this family. So Interesting. Yeah, well, I'm adopted, so I wonder if I chose a family that would put me up for it up you know i have wondered right. about that when people talk mm -hmm. about choosing their parents their their birth parents and i think well i didn't i guess i didn't choose my birth parents i chose mm -hmm. to be adopted and and then maybe i chose my adopted parents i don't know how that's done but maybe you chose both or who knows mm -hmm. if we pre-planned it's hard to know right um a reluctant reluctant sojourner recalls light at birth angie recalls a great reluctance to be born before cervical dilation before my birth, I felt bathed in peace and safety all around. A bright, soft light appeared in the darkness. I kept fighting. I knew it would be so very cold if I went to the light. As I was thinking about what was to happen, I heard a male voice say, you must go to the light now. You are only going for a little while. You will come back. Trust me that everything will be okay. I didn't want to leave. I felt like this being was right there with me. I felt safe with him and went to the light. And just as I already knew, it was cold. I saw the doctor, a nurse, and my mother. A woman singing to me warmed me up and placed me on a scale. I was afraid that I might fall off. Mom's voice calmed me down, and everything felt okay after that. Hmm. Beams of light is the next one. We are all beams of light. Tim planned his last lifetime on Earth. I remember where I was before I was born. I was home. I loved everyone deeply and knew they loved me the same. We were all souls traveling, coming and going. That place is home for all of us. I met my spiritual guide before birth. I was lying in the grass under a tree in this heavenly world. I was thinking about the thrill of coming into the physical world. I knew without any doubt that after this life, I would stay back home for good. I felt a sigh of relief. I reflected on past lives, like flipping through 3D images in a Rolodex file. With each blink of my eyes, I saw one life after another. Bam, bam, bam. I thought, oh, I remember that. Or, oh, there's that possession I missed. I suddenly stood up and told my guide, I'll do it. Next thing I knew, I was slammed into my mom's belly. I felt the physical world, loud gushing sounds, heartbeat, and bowel tones. I yelled, I want to go back. I don't want to do this again. <laughs> Immediate regret, right? From over there, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea because you're just kind of reminiscing really mm. on the, all the good stuff and you forget about the bad. 
or you're, while you're over there and everything's so wonderful, you can't even wrap your head around or conceptualize like how, I guess, how bad it's going to be. Because the guys are like saying, oh, I have to warn you, it's going to be difficult. And you're like, yeah, 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 I'm fine. <laughs> huh. Yeah. And then they talk about Howard Storms, uh, NDE, where he told his guys that going back to the, he, he told them that going back to Earth as a world filled with hate and competition would be cruel, but he lists reasons why, and they list reasons why they sh should not send him back. You know, he could get their teachings about love and compassion, and the spiritual world offers everything he desires, whereas human life is filled with problems. And he could not exist without these beings of great love, and he does not know how to connect with these divine beings while on Earth. The guides gently explain why Howard should return. They assured him that mistakes are an acceptable part of being human. Mistakes are the way he will learn. The world is a beautiful manifestation of God, and depending on where we direct our mind, we find beauty or ugliness. Every aspect of creation is fascinating, and it's a great opportunity. And Howard ran out of arguments and agreed to return to his body. And he, hmm. so I guess that's the end of the Howard Storm. And he's a, that's a famous NDE, um, one that they actually used because he was kind of like, he's not one to come back to earth, I guess. But they were yeah, convincing well, him why. Yeah, more be persuasion, yeah, more manipulation. Persuasion. Right. He ran out of arguments. Okay, I guess I'll go back. You know, they got an answer for everything, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, the next one judged himself as not worthy to be liberated, so manifested another lifetime on Earth. Raghavan, a 44-year-old businessman from India and a happily married man with three children, recalls, I remember my untimely death at a young age in my previous life. I was stabbed and life ended in pain. While dying, I tried to remember details about that life. Some external force purposefully erased my memory. I only recollect the dying process. After death, I flew with God's messenger. The divine escort telepathically informed me that I was going for judgment. The messenger asked me to wait in a dimension of total emptiness. I stood on a platform structure floating in space. My soul felt not my time to go to heaven permanently for final liberation. Instead, if I do good deeds in my next birth, these merits will count towards final salvation. Finally, the Supreme One entered my thoughts. What sort of a rebirth do you want? Do you want luck or do you want a good family with secure finances, but you will not have any luck? I opted for the good family without luck. Next, I found myself nestled in mom's womb. Huh. Wow. So I don't know, they're talking about final salvation and, you, you know... Yeah. But you have to like make a sacrifice like apparently like in order to get that final salvation you know you don't want to be egotistical and greedy and say oh i want luck and comfort and rich and it's like no you got to be a sac you got to sacrifice and have this horrible painful life to to sacrifice and show that yes i'm ready to be saved <laughs> when why would you do that if you can instantly manifest anything over there anyway and you know there's this thought that we're going into a 5d earth and things are going to there's going to be less suffering and less cruelty and we're on this evolution to becoming this beautiful place but if the if this is true that the, we grow <clears throat> from suffering and all these entities up there are angels or divine i don't even know why they're called divine um say no you got to go to this place so that's the way you grow and you have to have the more suffering the better then this then why would those entities who are in charge why don't want they want to come back? Why want do they want to stay there? Well, why so, would yeah, they if you can grow by suffering, well, come on with me. Come on. <laughs> that too. But if it's true that this planet is evolving and eventually it's not going to have any suffering, then what are those entities going to do with us then? Yeah, we would be like, okay, well, we, well, now we're bored. And I mean, one of the theories is that it's maybe just too boring like perfection is boring it's too sterile it's like when you know everything there's no surprise to anything and so we come down here we purposely limit our abilities and our knowledge so that we come down here and there's a little bit of a challenge and you have to work to get something and but yet there's these all these surprises everyone loves to be surprised but i don't like surprises where you like hurt yourself you break your leg that's not a fun surprise to me <laughs> you know i don't know that's what they say it's the surprise of it but i I just feel like there can be surprise and unpredictability without cruelty. Exactly. Exactly. 
So it, ha it has to be stuff. more. I, so that's why the surprise doesn't doesn't connect with me. It's like maybe a challenge of some nature, but not the you know being surprised. I don't know. And it's interesting um, how all of these experiences are colored just a different, a little bit differently. There are similarities, but they're they're really the the descriptions are just so different on what they experience. It's I wonder why. Why isn't it just all of them are the same kind of experience? Descriptions all the same. Variety, I guess. If there's a god or there's a source or a, a, all that is or an awareness and maybe it just likes to be creative it's creative nature and it just wants to have as many experiences as it can just to experience it or maybe it is trying to learn at some level what all is possible i don't know i don't know the answer to that question but it's a very good one yeah um so the next one is ex tibetan monk and a bodhisattva vow I realized that the world's problems were great. I was aware of atrocities of history, such as the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. I felt I needed more experience from the source in order to help others. If I were to be born as a Tibetan teacher again and merely held that position, I would not make a significant difference. I chose to learn from a different perspective to bring something new to earth beyond what I had known in my previous life. Unification and birth within the great mother. When I sensed conditions getting better on earth and the storm passed, or at least stabilized, I looked within my being at a tiny spark of reddish orange light. During this contemplation, I broke beyond the veil of the blue sphere, beyond what was taught to me as a Tibetan Buddhist, and beyond my limited perception, I began traveling toward the southwest. My consciousness seemed so vast, I became aware of a state in my evolution never experienced before in past lives. I then traveled into the center of the galaxy, approaching a great black void where I became aware of a vastly primordial motherly presence. While communing with this presence, I felt the life force emanating from every living being on every star through me as if I were a conduit. I resolved, this is too much of a gift for me alone. I need to share it. I want every being in the universe to experience this. I vowed to forever work for this purpose. <laughs> that is something i mean the, the, the vote is off a vow by the way for those maybe who don't know is that I, I believe the way i understand it is that they want to keep reincarnating over and over and over again or at least have contact here on earth until every single soul has been liberated or freed and so um it's quite a battle of sacrifice but if it's true that we really do manifest reality with our intentions and they set the intention that they are going to come here to be helping people souls that are that need freeing then aren't they manifesting souls that need freed or that they're which comes first the chicken and the egg you know what i mean right why can't they right. set an intention that there are no souls that need free that everyone is freed and then mm -hmm. i don't know it's just an interesting yeah. paradox to me of how all that works <laughs> Um, the next one, Floyd felt fulfilled with a great mystery. It says, the void was a holy place. There was only light. Evil could not touch this realm. I pondered what my new awareness meant. The light was a part of me, and I was a part of the light. The light had an intelligence and identity. I had been reborn into non-duality, a community of spiritual beings who were pure consciousness beyond the confines of ordinary perception, where everything is filtered through our five senses. They had neither masculine nor feminine presence. Identity was distinguished by character to let telepathically radiate, radiated through the light. Mm -hmm. Next one. Uh, and in the near-death experience episodes, we went through some of the ones that were in the void and how it's like a place of neutrality that's beyond space and time and maybe thought and emotion. It's, but many feel it's like pure bliss, but it's like basically a cosmic womb where it's a place of potentiality where anything is possible. And you can stay there basically, uh, I guess you're almost like pure, like you're a point of awareness or it's only when you manifest, like when you choose, you want to have some kind of experience or reality, I think that creates light and that all these worlds of light and stuff is when we choose to have experiences. But when you just choose to stay in the void and not have experiences, then you're, there's no light maybe? So, so this planet, this existence would be just one potentiality that, that right. came to be. Out of billions probably. Or, or um, but... I don't know. I mean, did it evolve into to how awful it is? Maybe it began with 
you know, good potential and was a positive thing that went sideways? I don't know. Well, some cause... feel that we still are growing and being more and more positive and it's hard to say. I mean, we still have wars, we still have hatred, we still have murders and we certainly have grown technologically and we have more knowledge, but right. I, I don't know. If it's a tough, I mean, things were pretty bad in the past, but I wouldn't say that we're necessarily evolving or growing. And, and, and even if we were, it's such a slow process. Is this really the best tool for learning and growth or is just evolution just such a slow process? Why would evolution have to be such a slow process? I don't know. It just doesn't seem like we're learning our lesson, humanity. Mm -hmm. If this is where we learn lessons to become more compassionate. Well, maybe some do. Maybe some do <laughs> learn the lessons and they go on. And maybe this is just always like the third grade or first grade. And there's always new souls that come up. And this is just a place where people have to like work through that. I don't know. I don't really know. Hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like a really best learning environment for evolution. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, the next one is Supreme Initiation by a Being of White Light. Floyd caught a glimpse of one great being of white light. This being had served the light. Floyd had been given the choice to stay in the higher worlds for a while. Instead, he chose to be reborn. The immense light being counseled me. Your next life will be difficult, yet you have an opportunity to grow more. Many atrocities will be committed in the world. You will not have the same opportunities as in your prior life. You may not be recognized. Circumstances will be more challenging. The vast consciousness of this light being inspired me to continue my evolution and I desired further growth. Mm -hmm. I don't know why this being wants more and more, more and more growth, more and more evolution, more and more power, more and more knowledge. Um, what is it? Yeah, what is it that, that, that they want more of this thing? I mean, and when aren't you loving? Enough? And you need to have atrocities to become more loving and compassionate. Is that what it's saying? Or kind of some prying. Like if you go to the gym and you have to work, push heavy weights and your muscles have to hurt in order for them to grow. I just don't understand that whole line of thinking that you need to have pain and suffering in order to grow because I mean I think people can grow with love too I've when people extend love to me and set a great example to me it encourages me and inspires me more so than somebody who's going to yeah mm -hmm. be hard on me I think I don't know mm -hmm. so uh the next one Diane's soul entered this life after a long course of previous existences on earth and in other dimensions where she acquired her gifts as a healer our soul seeks wholeness. Our soul is designed to grow. We take, as she says, our soul is designed to grow. We take journeys into a diverse array of forms to enhance our awareness. When I came out of flesh as spirit after my last life, I went through 11 substations before resting in an inner realm of light. I reviewed my life's lessons and my awakenings to the truth. What was that about for me? What did I learn? What is it in the life that I kept out because I was afraid? What did I not allow to happen because I didn't see the whole picture? Sometimes I was not as open to the love and opportunities because my upbringing shadowed over the truth of my soul. I reflected on what chakra. To be in human form is the best gift we can receive. Each body is a unique genetic blueprint. Compared to all the angelic realms, source included, Human existence with all its diversity, coexisting opposites, and all its learning and sensory input is the grandest of the grand. Source is easy. It only knows source. Human life is the beauty. <laughs> I guess if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I guess it's true that if you want to see beauty in something that's not, you know, everybody, I guess, you know, it's what they perceive something to be, I guess. Um, you know, um, oh, I just, I had people do see beauty in that. <clears throat> I, I lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> I was going to share something and now I forgot. If you remember what it is, jump right in. And, okay. Um, so the next, um, awareness of first individuation from source. This is, sounds pretty interesting. I remember source. It was the most amazing bright light. Source has a definition, but it does not have the same edges as we do when we are in a human body. 
I remember the immense radiance and specific colors. The love at source is so pure and strong. We think it will be the same when we get down here. I go back to that memory of all that is. All that is one and the source of all of us when I do my healing work. Source is a place where there is no resistance, no contrast, only light, love, and purity. It is so broad and full, you don't see the parts. All feelings are there, not delineated feeling. When I was that flame, that undefined, unformed energy, I only felt expansion and the truth of, the, and the truth of that. I also remember the first time I dropped off from Source and chose to go down a separate path. I felt a gravitational pull to go and a force to stay. To stay in this place was perfect. Oh my God, how glorious is that? Yet the force to go was more important. My soul's enthusiasm wanted to explore and won over the safety and comfort of staying at Source. But I wanted the experience. It was like saying goodbye to your best friend. Why would I ever leave here? What was I thinking? It was hello, goodbye, all at the same time. To know thyself, you have to separate and come back. How do you know yourself if you are all oneness, all things? You cannot recognize something in oneness. You have to go out of oneness and experience the contrast. How can you recognize that if you don't move into duality so that you can see that there is this and that? How do you know thyself if you are all things and you do not have any contrast? That force was drawing me out. How can I know myself as a soul signature that is eternal if I do not move out of oneness? Most souls think they will remember when they leave source. Paradox paradoxically, one eighth of their memory is left at best. We emerge from source as a specific signature, an individual spark. This signature defines our soul with a significant tone, colors, configuration, and visual placement. No matter how many billions of people there are, there will never be anyone else with your signature. I love that. This eternal energy will move forward forever and always be that exact pure divine truth. Hmm. But, if, yeah. but if source is everything, then wouldn't it still be that which is emanating from it? Right. Or an and it, of it? is already complete. I just don't, I, I just, some of these stories, I'm, they're confusing because source is already complete and obviously mature and all loving, all blissful, all beautiful, but yet it needs source, if source is God, it needs us to go down and suffer and grow, even though we're perf perfected, perfect before we go. Source doesn't know itself already. It needs to send us mm -hmm. to know itself. I don't know. It's just really confusing. It is confusing. It's as, as if the source is still incomplete or that the source can still always be evolving, which is makes it just difficult to understand. The source isn't all that is, or all, at least all that can be maybe, or maybe it's all that can be, but it hasn't been yet, but yet time is all, there's no time over there. It's yeah, it's just very confusing for us to try to understand. Sure. <clears throat> Next one. Earth, I see how I'm doing. I have an overview and know that I am lacking in my overall lesson plan. Nothing is forbidden for me to know. I scan past lives. I look at what I need to do nine lives ahead. I can experiment to realize what I need to figure out about myself next so I can grow more. I can go anywhere, learn anything, and hang with anyone I want to be with, including myself. A discussion, a powwow takes place with my angel or soul group. I tend to be hypercritical. I didn't get that right. Boy, I wish I had done that differently. My angels encouraged me to be gentle. No, you did fine. Your life was lovely, incredible. You learned this and you learned that. I always picked the one thing I didn't hit. They say, don't be upset. Look at the big picture, not that tiny speck that didn't turn out perfect. So there's one where it's kind of the other way around. <laughs> They're like saying, oh, no, you did fine. It's like, don't worry about it. It's interesting. Hmm. If you didn't want to go back, they would have been the first ones to say, oh, yeah, you need to go back. <laughs> right, right. Let's do better. Um, meeting my daughter in the cosmic void. Even in the case of adoption, the first step is choosing parents. David entered a deep state during meditation. He entered the void, a state of absolute stillness. A feeling of great love permeated the experience. A bright light manifested and said, I am going to be your daughter, and my name is Zara. I felt overwhelmed with joy and peace. At the time, I had frequent meditations of the void, and yet I had never had a similar experience before or after. So that's an interesting one, and how it could relate to your experience. I mean, I do really do feel like all is known or planned before we come down here, including your 
biological parents and your adoptive parents, I would imagine. But just another story there. Later, when I, this is another one, uh, later when I acquired the vocabulary, I told mom that we had been together in an assembly of light beings, like a gathering of your best friends having a good time. Everything was pure and on the same wavelength. We interacted telepathically. A higher being with a motherly presence counseled each soul in the assembly concerning their life plan. The great being told me, this is your plan, your goal. These are things you have to endure and go through. Everything will make sense in the end. So take it and go. That's that. The next one, they, they mentioned PM Atwater's, PMH Atwater's uh, near-death experience. And she uh, said, for the first time, I looked upon myself to see what possible form or shape I might have. And to my surprise and joy, I had no shape or form at all. I was not but a sparkle of consciousness, the most minuscule spark of light imaginable, and that is all I was. I was content that way, without ego or identity, pure, whole, and uncomplicated. Within that nothingness I had become, I simply existed, ecstatic and perfect bliss and peace, perfection itself and perfect love. Everywhere around me were sparkles like myself, billions and trillions of them, winking and bleaking like on-off lights pulsating from some unknown source. Hmm. And then they mentioned the last thing from the book is they mentioned Plato and uh, he wrote, uh, Socrates argues that the soul is immortal and continually moves between our world and the underworld. When the soul entered our world, we call it birth and when it leaves, we call it death. But in reality, the soul never perishes since it, since it has over time seen all things, both in this world and the underworld, the soul knows everything. There is nothing it has not learned. Thus, what we generally call learning is nothing but the soul recollecting or recollecting what it already knows. Hmm. Huh. Uh, something you had mentioned earlier is that the soul makes a contract with the physical avatar. Do you remember one of the stories saying that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that made me think, well, then does the physical avatar have a, a consciousness? Because what do you mean that the soul makes a contract with a body? You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I, the, I, there's a difference, differentiation, in my opinion, between a soul and a spirit. Now, I don't know if Plato makes that distinction or not, but I feel like the spirit is our true essence at its innermost core, that it's a spirit and that it is like more like a spark. Like when you go into the physical, there, like I don't, like I think that maybe the soul is the connection between the spirit and the physical body. Like I look at it as a soul, like if we've had a, a, a hundred, like you've had a thousand lives, then maybe you've had a thousand souls. And that's, I mean, I don't know, it's just sort of maybe one of the ways I'm thinking of it and that you have one spirit, but that spirit could be connected to other spirits maybe, or maybe all the souls are connected together as, as one over soul or spirit. You know, people get into the, the terminology and it gets to be confusing. They're... No, I just, well, that too, that's curious, mm -hmm. but the, no, that someone was suggesting that the soul or spirit, I think he said soul, makes mm -hmm. a contract with the body, but mm -hmm. why it, do you need can... a contract with, a, with something that doesn't have a conscious Yes. Did these avatars have their own consciousness? I just well, thought. yeah. There's there's the idea that the physical body is has its own lower level consciousness. Like it's a very low level. Like it's almost like an ant. Mm -hmm. The body itself can exist on its own. Like if the spirit left it, it could still somehow. There's a little bit of consciousness possibly, but then of course it's when the soul dies and leaves, and when the spirit dies and leaves, the body's dead, right? But I've heard uh, near death experiencers uh, talk about like when it. And also Gnosticism talks about how you're joining, you're being bonded with this like lower level consciousness. Like you have this su super consciousness, which is yeah. like so far beyond. It's almost I, like a programmed. Well, I, I did um, on my, the other channel with, uh, with my sister, I interviewed a um, um, bendy ear. She was thrown, oh no, she wasn't thrown off. She, she was caught between two horses and being crushed and she popped out of her body and she witnessed her physical body screaming and yelling and fight still fighting back yeah. to, against being crushed and she thought oh there's that that body you know my suit or whatever mm -hmm. it's confusing because some of the other end eaters will say oh this is like a like a pair of jeans or something and then you take off and you throw on the throw off and you go off like we're just wearing 
this, but then other people like that NDE, she said, it we may have like chosen to join consciousness with this lower level being like, okay, huh. I can use this as a vehicle to further my own experience or you know what I'm saying? Like maybe, yeah. it's, maybe it's not just your consciousness that is in the body. There could be a lower level consciousness that you have yoked with, you know? Actually it reminded me of scripture, uh, Paul in one of his letters writing about how he, um, he kind of differentiated between two consciousnesses in his own body. Mm -hmm. That's it also a pre prevalent belief in Gnosticism. There's a, when they talk about, I can't remember which book it is, but they talk about how the spirit is put into the body and that, yes, there's like a, almost like a lower level consciousness that it's like yoked or bonded with. And so it's, that's why they feel that physical body is sort of like a prison mm -hmm. for the, for the spirit, you know, cause the spirit's free to go and do whatever it wants. But once you're, put into this body it's like you know you maybe travel around at night or something but um yeah it's makes me, and we, we're not going to get into this now but then it makes me wonder about all the different physical ets that are in existence mm -hmm. like do they have also have a consciousness that ensouls their et avatar and as it are they feeling as trapped as humans do <laughs> and then it made me think mm -hmm. oh i wonder if ET sleep and dream but that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know it's for another day for sure um so that's the end of the um of that material there was one last um there was a podcast called love covered life which where she talks about her I think it's a woman when she talks about her pre-birth memories and what she saw on the other side and her memories before this life. I don't know how, how much time we have, if we have time uh, to get into it or not. But, um, no. Well, we, we're at 55 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it just depends if you want to keep it under an hour or if you want to go a little over. But Well, can we add this to another program, another show uh, episode? Or you, um, will it not be a good fit? Is it a lot? Um, it's a little bit. I mean, I'll just try to summarize it because I got some some comments that are in bold. So maybe I'll just go through the bold stuff. So she basically said, you are being made entirely out of light. Really what you are is you're an orb of shining light. Everything in existence is made of what we would call light. Everything is interconnected and in how we're all one. And this is actually literally true. And she says, and the light is not just physical light as we know it, it's a metaphysical light. It is love and peace and bliss and joy and comfort and security. You feel it all around you and also inside you because it's making every, up everything. So it's making up everything and it's flowing from one thing to another, from one person to another. So the light is coming off one person intermingling with the light from another person. And she says, there's no separation, it's all the same thing. I remember Jesus being brighter than all the other beings. And then she talks about these advanced beings whose job it is to protect humanity and guide in human evolution. And she says, maybe they can only help if they've been asked. She says, I remember dark places on the other side, which I've come to understand that near death experiences often described as the void. I remember being in a dark place of reflection and it was so deeply comforting and so deeply peaceful. It was like I was folding in on myself. And it's like when you get into the deepest level of meditation where you're just so present, but you're also in a quiet place where there's nothing to pay attention to. She says, as soon as the light comes into the picture, it's no longer such a place of peace and reflection. It instantly becomes about the picture. Um, or, I'm sorry. It instantly becomes about desire. You want to be in the light. The light is the culmination of everything that you could ever imagine wanting. When the light comes into the picture, it's all you can think about. The only thought that exists to you anymore is getting to the light. It's incredibly magnetic. And this is what I remember the most vividly of anything is the light. This is what has never left me. Knowing that there was that something out there that would satisfy every desire. I remember that the light behaved like a large being like the size of the universe made up of many microscopic beings. If I can put it that way, like a school of fish or a flock of birds and all the little minuscule lights like rainbow diamonds and they would move in unison and it was mesmerizing addictive to watch and it's really hard for me to describe this because it can actually end up sounding really inappropriate i mean when the light would touch you 
it's just the ecstasy that you would feel the waves of bliss and joy and it would be calling you inviting you in deeper wow. and there was the sun of brilliance within so hot and so brilliant within the light like the heart of existence and i do remember being within what felt like a hurricane of light and there were columns of light going up and down all around making up the structure of the light and it was like this whirlwinds of light and i was just tossed in the wind and i was completely caught up in the ecstasy of the light it was all i knew I think those things are in the darkness as well, maybe more in the form of potential, but in the light you can explore and you can experience all those things. Another memory I have of being in the light is more like an explosion was happening. The light was exploding all around me and it was like a deep warm laughter that was creating sort of like the Big Bang, like massive explosion of light, but it wasn't just light, it was everything. It was color and patterns and music and laughter. It was a being that was like laughing itself outward into existence. It was like floating in an ocean of light and love and it was more peaceful but it still contained everything like you could be there for lifetimes and never grow bored because there was so much to explore and this time i remember knowing that i was going to have to leave and i remember how heart-wrenching it was to leave that light behind um so she says about these memories she says um everything there is music everything is music and there's different variations of it in the darkness it's peaceful and quiet and calming in the light and just a couple little more things. She says, the best way I can describe this music is that it was building and building and building, continually resolving itself. As it would build, it would build the tension and resolve as it continued to build. I don't know, I'm not a musician. I don't know how or even if that can be replicated in this world. Maybe reality itself was singing and it was like it was all for you, like it was a song of love for you and you were surrounded and immersed in it. So it was almost like music theory when there's like seven chords and like they talk about the first, the fourth and the fifth are major chords and the second, third and sixth are minor. And but there's like, you know, there's a song Hallelujah, which just talks about ecstasy and heaven and all that. But it's like, yeah, you know, it goes like this, the first the, or the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift. So like there is like a build up and, and a release yeah. of like builds up the tension and you want to resolve that tension by finally ending going back to the main home chord, you know. It's just really interesting how she's describing it that way, where there's this build up and keeps building. Well, she's not a musician, but yes. Um, anyway, I thought that was interesting how she kept talking about how the light is so attractive and alluring. And addictive. And addictive, yes. And that all your experiences are there in the light. So, like when you're in the void, it's a potentiality. I keep hearing this over and over and over again. And yeah. but once you have experiences, then that evidently explodes somehow into light and it's a it's a tied to your desires you know so interesting that's anyway that's all i had for the three birth memories for now yeah that one's really interesting um yeah that's why okay. i wanted to go over it yeah yeah and it, it it does fit with this episode for sure yeah um okay so yeah we'll wrap it up i um do we know what we're going to be talking about in the on the next one? Have we decided? In between lives, I think. With oh, in between the, um, lives, I think. Uh -huh. Michael Newton and Dolores Cannon material, and um, you know where people go in between their life, where they're choosing their next life, and you know, yeah, it's a, that one's a very, very, very important one too. You see a lot of manipulation there as well, and um, it kind of ties into with this one too, you know, in, in, a, yeah. in that way. So, yeah. It's, it's okay. going to be great. I really enjoy the Michael Newton books as well as the Dolores Cannon one on the in, on the in between live state. So yeah. All right. So we will close out. I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, this has been Julie McVeigh and Wayne Bush <laughs> and with Sovereign Spirits. <laughs> Sovereign Spirit. And if you enjoyed this discussion, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this type of content. Please subscribe to the channel, click on the bell icon so you're alerted to future videos. And this does help the content get out there more to other people who need to hear it. So um, yeah, thanks for being with us. We hope you have a fantastic day or evening wherever you are. On See the you next time. <laughs>